Welcome to Iris After Hours. Casual conversations with inspirational speakers off the clock. Hi, welcome back to Iris After Hours. We are here in our new studio. I am with my co-host Nathan Kotzer. Yes. And we are so excited to introduce one of our heroes. One of our mentors, our amazing acting coach, a woman who has taken on the theatrical film theatre acting world by storm over the last 38 years. She is literally a sign and a wonder. But the most incredible thing is she is a believer. She is a follower of Jesus. A radical and, one. Yes. And an amazing. She is like a prophet as well. She is a mother, a grandmother, and a healer. Like she has a really, really great sense of, of really seeing where people are at and bringing the presence of God to help healing. And she is a very good friend of ours as well. The one, the only, the immeasurably <laughs> amazing enough, enough. Diane Venora. <laughs> Diane. All right. Diane Venora, thank Thanks you for, for coming. being here. Thank you, guys. I love you. Diane. It's so good. I'm so glad you're our friend as well. You're an amazing person. It's true. Everything I said is true. That's true. It's a but bit hyper- as well. hyperbolic, is- but it, oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I love you guys. I feel honored to be your friend, that you're my friends. Aww. I do. Diane, it has been an incredible journey, your life. <laughs> because obviously you've shared, we're friends, so we know a lot, but we want to share with our whole podcast audience some of the amazing things that you've experienced and learned. You're an artist in your own right, um, an amazing artist with with. And I'd have to say this, an artist with so much integrity that you inspire both Christy and I, I think mm. I speak for Christy here so much, to to have that incredible, like, boldness that is, like, supercharged with humility at the same time. I mean, that is a crazy, crazy mix to have those two things going on. Let's just open with that. How do you do it, Diane? Like, you are so bold, so much integrity, calling things as they are, such a straight shooter, and yet you've got this humility that is willing to say, did I do something wrong? Did I offend you? Have I, you know, and that you come low, constantly come low as a, as a person, as, as a mentor to, 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 you know, lift others up around you and make sure everyone else around you is, is doing well. Oh, I've had to learn that. Right. Yeah. Um... I, I, the journey, I, I don't know. I think I've always been kind of, I've been a shy person as a child, but I lived in a home that said, do it faster, make it happen. So it kind of pushed me into a place that wasn't really normal for me. If you didn't do it, then you might get left out or you might not eat or you might not. So you had to be- Because you were one of six Yeah, we had, it's faster, speak it faster. I haven't got- time to listen to you, which is great preparation, by the way, for television, because you only have 30 seconds and can you get it done fast? So, <laughs> so I feel like my entire life of going really fast has prepared me for for, <laughs> for entertainment. <laughs> and as far as humility, that's something, um, there's a paradox to humility, I think, for actors and performers. Um, in the Christian world, if you are successful, sometimes they say you're not humble. Or if you're bold, they say you're arrogant or whatever. Mm-hmm. And they, they mix it. And sometimes, forgive me, but some people get a bit jealous. Right. They don't say it is, so they, they cloak it in a Christian Christianese. But um, a friend of mine who is a Christian writer and went to NYU, wrote a poem, and she's published and she also has several master's degrees, um, she wrote a poem called The Paradox of Humility because the church didn't understand someone like me. Wow. And she talked about how all the world needs air and water, how important they are. But fire is important too. Whoa. And she said fire that can that can burn up, you know, exposing liars and child molesters and devour murderers and things like that, that, that sometimes you're the only love in a frozen room. So she told me that I should stay who I was. Because when I was in a church, when I first got saved, I tried to be like them. And it was like wearing somebody else's armor, somebody else's outfit. So mm-hmm. being an actor, I figured I could do that. I could wear somebody else's costume until finally I, I felt like I was dying. 
I felt like I was truly dying inside in this, in churchianity. Um, I needed to get out, but I didn't know how to get out. Churchianity? Yeah, it was like That's churchianity. Yeah. yeah. And I remember looking out the window in New York and all my friends were, were at the theater across the street for the Tonys. And I was felt locked up in a in a church where people didn't understand that I had to like eat it and, and suffocate in order to be accepted in the community, which I wanted very much to be accepted in because mm. I had just received Christ and um, what did I know? So that wasn't an easy transition. No. Yeah, look, tell us that story. <laughs> How did it happen? Obviously, there was a point where you made a decision as well, an adult. But to, to receive Christ? Yes. Well, I, had, I was in a major car crash. I was, I was, I've always had, after going to Juilliard, I, I had nothing but success because the school is so difficult to get into, stay in. I'm not saying... Now, just for our listeners, Juilliard is probably the, probably the best acting school. Well, in, it's, it's one of. Um, I mean, one of, yeah. when I the went there, I felt it was like the golden age. Um, oh, you went through with Robin Williams. Yeah, and Kelsey Grammer, like, and the great John Hausman ran the school, and we had phenomenal teachers, and we yeah. had guest artists. Like, whenever there'd be a play that came into, into Broadway, we got to see it. He always made us go. We had the cheap seats, but we went. <laughs> and um, so Richard Burton taught us poetry and, and, and Anthony Hopkins. And, and then we had a master class with um, the great uh, Pavarotti. Oh my goodness. And Arthur Rubinstein. And we had classes with uh, John Gielgud spoke to us and Siobhan McKenna and the great Zoe Caldwell and Vanessa Redgrave gave us a whole thing on Hamlet. And um, I remember her saying, what is the definition of acting and everybody in the class was quoting Stanislavski and I was in a very bad relationship and I kind of knew something and, and finally it was my turn I said well I think acting is meeting a crisis and dealing with it and the reason why I said that because I couldn't mm. I couldn't and then she went through the whole group and then she said the person who said acting is meeting a crisis and dealing with it that's that's the answer and everyone kind of like said oh Venora and I was like no, it's because I haven't figured out how to do that. Mm. You know, so, so acting brought me face to face with things that I thought by acting I could avoid. Mm -hmm. But instead, acting brought me wow. directly to confront, to confront the issues that you needed to confront through the play. Wow. But you have to bring your, you have to lend yourself to it. So mm -hmm. if I'm running away from life, I, I'm not going to be a classical actor at the Juilliard School. There's no way. After four years of that kind of training, where they... So you need four years? Four years. In the two years, they take audiences away from you. So they, it's built... The humility of great acting is that the play is always bigger than the actor. Ah, mm -hmm. that's another key. So you are there to wow. serve. So to me, as I got older, I thought, it reminds me of the kingdom of God. Come on. Really, because a real you, need, you need discipline. You need to be selfless. Wow. You need to be curious about others. You need to serve the play, serve the actor, serve the producer, serve the director. It's not all about you. It's not about you. In fact, it's, it's, you are the least thing in it. But what the greatest thing is the role that you are playing. Can you keep up with a great writer? Can you appreciate someone else's humanity without judgment? You can't judge yeah, a role. Yes, that's, that's, a big that's a big key. You cannot cannot play, judge you it. You can't judge the character you're playing at all. So I'm looking Otherwise at you're like gone. Exactly. Yeah. And then you have to find you. Ha everything is about love. The greatest acting is through love. Love is the only creative force. Wow. So if you make negative choices, they won't say this in class, but I'm piecing this together as I'm going on. So you have no audiences. So whatever you think you're good at, they take it out. That you become almost free, open to to allow things to come to you. Then this brought me into a spiritual component. If an actor spiritually is not open, you can go through every kind of training, every kind of technique, but if something inside you is not good, not healthy, you can literally build a career on your problem. You can build a career on your anger, you can build a career on your, on your abuse, and then as the years go by, that stronghold gets bigger because Hollywood brands you Mm. You're this kind of an actor, mm -hmm. and they give you the same, but the same, but the same. Now, you have great actors like Danny Day-Lewis. You have Meryl Streep, who are not branded. No. They can go in other directions, which tells me there's enormous health in that actor as well. So I'm looking at all these mm. different components. So for me, um, the school, because, because my life came up in front of me, and the school gave me a four-year scholarship and believed in me somehow. They cared about me somehow. They thought I had something that they actually brought me to my first psychiatrist and they paid for it. 
wow. so that I could have. Well, have I really looked after I've you? I've never yes. heard of something like that. That's and, and, and Juilliard does because it takes, they only pick seven actress, seven women per year. Is it rare to get a scholarship there, I imagine? I, th- I think so. Yeah. So, so if they pick seven in your class, seven women, how many graduated at the end? Only five. Right. So you, there is a culling process over those four years. Yeah. So well. the first two years, they decide who's going to stay and who's not going to stay. By your third year, mm-hmm. they have the company. Then the company they support. They will pay you. They put you on tour. Um, we went to Brazil for three weeks. We went to the Bermuda Festival. We replaced Jessica Tandy and Hume Cromen for... Uh, because she was ill, and we played. Because um, uh, because it's a British, I mean, it was a British colony, so they they play, you know, God Save the Queen before, and they have a box for the royals, you know, and we did Midsummer Night's Dream to a big success for us. Um, our class. Who did you play in Midsummer Night's Dream? I played Hermia. Oh, Hermia. Yeah, Robin Williams played like how many fairies, and and Kelsey played the king, and <laughs> was he bottom, Robin Williams? No, that oh, was, that, no, they no, didn't, that, they didn't that, do comedy, well, no, that he he he's funny no matter what. But he did a lot of we did a lot of mask work, so he played like mustard scene and blood devil, oh all these different <laughs> crazy role characters. So, uh, oh but anyway, the the bottom line was, I felt that acting could be a religion, and it bothered me because I didn't want to have that religion. Mm-hmm. I was raised Catholic, and I really loved God. Um, and yes, they, tell us about that experience. So, like we're, we're here at Juilliard, and we're we're leading up to your. Salvation. Salvation. Can we just backtrack now? We'll come back to that. But just, you were brought up a Catholic. What experiences did you have of God as a child? Well, I, I always, I feel like if you called somebody a mystic, I would be a mystic. Mm. I, I, the, the mysteries of God. I was always fascinated by the mysteries of God and to this day. And then people would say to me, why do you always wear black? And I'd say, well, um, I was raised in a school that, that was the uniform of classical training. But it also, uh, it suited me. Till I found out at going to Bethel that black, in one of our cl- our classes, black is the color of mystery. Oh. The deep things of God. Mm. The unknown things. So I thought, oh, I would dress appropriately then. Also because it keep, keeps me calm. Also in a school like that, um, I just coached people from the Central School of Speech and Drama that came in from London uh, last week. Yes, we were there at that workshop. Right, yeah. and, and they were dressed, they, they were in the lobby dressed exactly like yes. like Juilliard, you know. Um, but the church seems to put labels on things, unfortunately, and they'd say, well, you should wear other colors. So I wore red today. Hi. <laughs> I love it. Um, that's another color I do like. But, and um, I wear black because I wear black every day I wear, as I wear well. Bl- because it calms me. Also, at school, it's because they want to see the actor, the, the what do you call it, the gesture, the shape. They don't want to see clothes. They want to see the performance, the, yeah. you know, the, the jet, whatever that is. The, I call it the plastique of, of movement and, right. and, and, and mind. So um, when I received my first communion, this is hard because uh, we had, had, had to confess our sins. And I didn't oh, have any that I knew of, so I made them up. Because I was seven, I thought I should make them up. So I'd at least be... Uh, oh, so this is when you were seven. Yeah, so, so I said, well, I, and you have to tell how many times, and I would say at least how many times, and finally the priest goes, excuse me, don't you think that's a mortal sin? I go, oh, okay. A mortal sin? A mortal brother, a venial sin. And I went, oh, okay. I guess that's good. Anyway... I just didn't know, so I thought I wanted to please people, so I'd come up with something. See, always acting. <laughs> and, and, and then, <laughs> convincingly, what, but when probably. I came to the first communion, I'll never forget it. When, when the, I believed in the trans figuration of God. Oh, transubstantiation. Yeah. And so, Actually when I re- the body and blood of Jesus. Yeah. When I received it, I'll never forget this as long as I live. I felt the presence. Now, I, the presence of God just, I mean, overwhelmingly, like as if it, like, like. As if it was like a, I can't, like a wave Whoa. of just presence that then did this. It took off of my shoulders a heavy weight that I'd been carrying almost for seven years. I felt that something had come and removed from me all these heavy burdens that I didn't know I had, but I knew that I now didn't have them. Wow. It was a true experience of the presence of God. So I felt that God not only knew who, who I was, he, he loved me. And I felt it in that moment. So 
I love the church. I mean, I, I love the Catholic Church. You were how old? I was seven. That was seven. Yeah. Wow. I'll never forget it. And I knew something changed. Yes. And I've always been a child who, I didn't sleep much as a child, but I would always sit on a radiator and look out and pray and know that there was something beyond that star or something beyond. But I just wanted it to to, to help me without knowing what, it, what, I, what I was asking, you know. Wow. So that child um, is still with me. I've had a lot of healing for her. Um, and, and Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry, that, that, that changed my life in a great way. I've had a lot of healing, a, a lot of things. Yeah, that your journey of healing, yeah. which obviously you've shared which, with which me is before, what, which, I want to yeah. talk about, but that it's incredible how many processes you've gone through in your healing because the and bo- the people that have really inspired you. Because the bottom line is that I've always believed that freedom in here is more important than life itself. Wow. And for me as a performer and as a creator, the great artists that I've known, w- with all of the mess baby in their lives, they have a freedom inside, whether it's based on anger or genius or whatever. But if I thought, but even if that actor had total freedom spiritually, what would he then be? Because what I was always aware of is that an actor can be trapped in the gift that he has. Because as the years go by, he can't get away from whatever, whatever makes you famous in this mm-hmm. town. Now everybody owns a piece of you. Mm-hmm. You're branded, agents, managers, uh, club dates, tours. You put out an album. They want you to tour with it for a year, but maybe the artist already has two more albums but they, and they slow it down. And everybody takes a piece of you. So you go in for it. I remember what Houston saying, it's not fun anymore. Oh, Whitney. Yeah, mm. it's not fun anymore. Or then it becomes like, it's like it owns you. So I was always aware of my freedom inside. I don't want it to own me. But it would own me if I get wrapped up in the money, if I get wrapped up in the idolatry, oh, wow. which it is. And it's very easy to say, I love a lot of Christians saying, oh, I want to do this. I go, yeah, but you've never tasted success at that level. And if you do, you better be dang sure yeah. that you have nothing in common with that kind of ambition or need for approval or Gosh. fame because it will take you out. Yeah. Like that. I was just going to ask you about that. You say you should have nothing nothing in common with the spirit of Hollywood. Nothing in common. It's the spirit of Babylon. It's the spirit of Assyria. There's all these all these different idols. The only person I know who addressed that, I mean, would be Katie Sousa's ministry on Kingdom of the Sun, breaking off idolatry. I thought to myself, I'm not gonna, I don't have any idolatry. Mm-hmm. So I, I went and took it anyway because I want freedom. Mm-hmm. And I put it on my way to Bethel. And the first one I had, second one, I, I had them all. Nine hours later, I'm only halfway through these seven CDs. I'm going, <laughs> but, me, but when I got there, suddenly... I was cl- there was a clarity wow. and authority because she said, if you have anything in common with the spirit of Hollywood, you'll have no authority in it. Wow. So that really literally means if there's stuff inside of you that is unresolved wanting... Yeah, it will play the, off... Like bad things or wanting the bad parts of success. Or not even bad. They, they, could just, be, they could be good parts. The point is, what, at what price... If you meet one of your, I mean, one of the most famous people that you love and honor, I bet some of my heroes, and I meet them personally, and I go, oh, I wish I never met them. Because creatively, I love their work. Personally, Mm -hmm. I was so disappointed in who they were Mm -hmm. as people. And then suddenly my whole heart went like, oh. And then I thought, what is the difference? What is the disconnect? How can you not be who you are? Now, in this business, you can't because you look at somebody wearing, sun- like, like Michael Jackson would wear sunglasses on the red carpet. Why? It was the only way he could keep himself away from mm. the, the, you know. But Bono is the same. That's what he says about what he wears. Because, the because the press will it's come at you. of separation. And they will say things to you that you, mm. want, you want to go like this. You're kidding me. You didn't ask me that question. And you just want to, this thing rises up in you. So mm. you have to find a way to be so free that when you hear something, you're not offended. Be unoffendable. How to be completely free of idolatry. How to be free. And that way, humor comes. Joy comes. And you can turn it around. I keep thinking of um, when Ronald Reagan was, was they, were, they were going after him about his age. Remember that? This is like the, the debate of debates. But <clears throat> This is before he was president? Yeah, because he, he had lost the first debate. So they were talking about how old he was. Mm-hmm. And so he had said something like this, you know, 
I really don't want this debate to be about age. I mean, I just want you to know that I actually can understand that my opponent's immaturity and lack of 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 age. I won't hold that against him. <laughs> it's like, so, so he turns it because there was something in him that he was not offended by those things, mm-hmm. and, and and a lot of people have that as a natural character trait. I didn't. I was raised with a lot of a lot of criticism, a lot of judgment, <clears throat> and when kids are raised in that kind of environment, they become that. And one thing you don't want is bitterness. And one of my for, for my family. Criticism, judgment, when in doubt, criticize, condemn, and judge. That's our default position. So God had to deal with that by healing all of that from me. So th- then the clarity of that. And then suddenly um, other parts are open because I can see a different role without coloring it. Then I worked with an actor who everything she did was like, every every line was like so bitter. And I said, um... So I had to go in a- another way saying, there, the way, so I had to record it so she could hear it. Do you hear how everything you do comes like da da da? Yeah. Yeah, I said, that's that's spiritual. That's that's in your soul. So we'll heal that and we'll change the way you, you respond to the text. So she did the work and she's working now. Wow. So I'm just saying that all acting did for me was I love humanity. Actors are geniuses at observing humanity mm-hmm. without judgment. Looking at someone's life and saying, what if I put your shoes on? Even someone like Hitler, if you got to play him. Mm. What could you possibly love about him? Wow, that's amazing. And if there's nothing you can love about him, then don't play him. Because there's something in his mind where he was right. Mm-hmm. He was right. He was, to me, yeah. like we could call he was demon-possessed. But, but you look at the etymology, a child like Manson, a child like Hitler, who was abused severely by a father. And all of the the Russian dictators all came from Catholic families. They had God, you know, and that's why they turned around and said, religion is the opium of the, of the people, because God was, was a farce, and they were, like, beat up in the name of. Yeah, treated terribly. Right, and so you see that. Um, Nikki Cruz would... would, would um, Crossing the switchblade. Did you ever meet Nicky Cruz? I, I met him. I, I met him. He was at church. He and, was in New York. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> but he he was that kid who was raised by warlocks yeah. and witches and hit with hangers and and locked up in a closet and he mm. turned into this. That's from those famous book Run Baby Run and the Cross on the Switchblade. Right. right. Yeah. So you have to see what what happened to those kids. The terrorists have taken these young kids, all those little soldiers, those child soldiers and they mm. rape them and sodomize them and wound them and then they become these terrorists mm-hmm. so so we see the result of such evil yeah how do we love that how do we how do we pray for that because mm. these kids have been tormented so um all this to say is that it led me on the path to ask questions of humanity because if i'm going to be an interpreter of it i have to be free enough so I haven't got my own cloudiness. To observe it without judgment. Right. So that's yeah. why I have a hard time with the politics in acting now. Because mm-hmm. it, it has, it has forgive me, but it has reduced the text of great work. Yes. By political correctness. Like or, a blanket on top of it. Yeah. It's, it's like, we, and so and, and everything gets small. Mm. I love epic. I love the great parts. I love Shakespeare and Chekhov and Shaw. And, 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 and you fought against that. In some of the roles that you've taken on, I know sometimes the directors come up to you and said, "Do it like this," and you've just well, it depends. See, it depends. I mean, when I work with great directors, mm-hmm. I'm quiet. Yeah, I just go, mm-hmm. But if I work with directors that are either being pushed by a committee, mm-hmm. see, I, I'm not good with committee. That's why television for me is always a, a television. A challenge. Well, because five people tell you how to play a scene, mm-hmm. but meanwhile, there's one way to play the scene for me. Based on understanding the text, but I, I and can the go, character, I, I, I can go in different directions. But if you say, "Say it like this," mm. now remember, I had no healing then, so I just went, "Well, I can say it like that for you." It's as dull as watching paint dry, but I can do that for you. <laughs> oh my God! I always say, actors never do what I did. However, I succeeded at it because it was me. But you won't get away with that. 
<laughs> but I didn't care about money. I didn't care about whether they hired or fired me. Why? Because there was something in me as an artist that knew. It's like a musician. I listen to Prince talk sometimes, and he goes, yeah, yeah, and he goes, it's your integrity. That's what I'm talking he, about. He goes, integrity well, you have. this is where I want to produce it, but you can't produce it. He goes, well, all right, I'll listen to you. And then in the end, he goes, no, my way is better. Because he knew. Why? Mm -hmm. Because the artist is a lonely person. He works on his craft. He works on his music. He works on, if he's a writer, he's working on it. He learns, but he, it's his words. It comes through his, his brain and his heart and his heartbeat and his cells and he puts it out there yes it's inspired you, you, so so it, it, it's not to say it's perfect because you we want to submit ourselves to yeah. greater people but when someone comes in who's flagrantly like takes it down 10 notches i had a choice to, and i have done I, i've said okay let it go mm -hmm. but but if it's if it's about the main character thrust that i'm playing the guest star i fought for it mm -hmm. and won because i didn't care I said it. I said, "Look, this is what it's going to be for me. I understand what you're saying." I said, "But um, because this character is so cliched, if we don't let this part come in like it just did, then it's not really quite interesting." And you did hire me. You did hire me. Mm -hmm. If you hired someone else, I can understand that. But since I'm here, this is what I see, and I'd like to do it. If you don't want to do it now, I understand. Then we will just cut it mm. and they were like all right we'll do it next and then they they said to each other oh now she's mad and and now we'll have to be here forever i didn't know they said that so when i came in sat down one take in out done <laughs> and they thought like because nice. so when you're trained in the theater you only get one take yeah mm -hmm. so you're actually a producer's dream <laughs> come on because a lot of the actors who have not taken acting training in theater and have been on the boards and doing repertory and playing great parts they can cost a producer thousands and hundreds of thousands of dollars just because oh I have to do it again it's a professionalism mm. and when I was on movie sets I mean people would say to me I, like the, the wardrobe would say are you from the theater I'd say yes I knew it I said well why because all your clothes are completely picked up they're all hung up your jewelry's in the right boxes, your shoes are in the right thing, oh. and your laundry's in the right bag. I go, well, doesn't everybody do that? And the man looked at me and said, Armani on the floor. Armani on the floor. Prada shoes, where are they? No. All I can say is, thank God for the theater and people like you. I said, oh, you're welcome. Thank you, Juilliard. <laughs> so discipline. Yep. And I think that in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, in our... God is love. So... You came out of Juilliard. Mm -hmm. Sorry to cut you off. I'm done. Just, we're heading back to your encounter with God in the car accident. And by the way, we're going to do several of these podcasts with you because we cannot fit your incredible story oh, and we can journey listen into to one you podcast. All day. So, yes. so we get we, so we can, we can take our time here. Um, but what happens? You leave, you graduate from Juilliard. You have your first job in The Three Sisters in 1978, mm -hmm. which is like 38 years ago, mm -hmm. your first professional gig. I remember it completely. Come on. So what happened in your journey from 1978 to when did you meet, when did you really have that encounter with God? And I, really I didn't meet God until 1986. 86, yeah. wow. Um, because I just... Uh, so what happened in those eight years? Since, well, like, I just got job, 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 job. I mean, I was doing really well, but I was so miserable inside. I... I made bad choices in my life. I had a lot of negativity, a lot of self-destruction. Got involved in drugs. Um, you got married. I got married um, to a famous director of photography. He, he was a young director of photography at the time, but a genius, absolute genius. I always married genius. And you married the man. Um, but I love, I love talent. Um, and he, he was he just a phenomenal human being. Um, and you had Maja, your daughter. They had that was now that was odd because I was in a in a in a, in a movie with Bob Fosse, and then um, I found out that I, I was pregnant, and I thought, how good, that's great. And then I thought, and then Bob Fosse said, what do you mean? He said, well, we waited two years to, fight, to cast this role, and I said, I know, but I'm having a baby now. And he was like, well, we'll put the baby into the script. So they put the baby into the script. Fantastic. <laughs> awesome. And I thought, but this is wearing a bikini by the pool. And then all of a sudden, my, Christ my Catholic came up like, I don't think that's right. I don't think one should do that. So I said, I don't think I want to be in this anymore. 
And he goes, well, what, what do you mean? Well, anyway, so I, I, I walked out of it because there was, there was some pornography elements oh, did you? In, in, in the film, and I didn't want to be part of it. There was yeah. something from that little girl who received communion back when I, she was wow. seven. Mm. See, so all Holy I know is that God, God when, he, when, he, when you say yes to him, I don't care where you are, how you are, what religion, you say yes, he's still there. Because I had this funny feeling like the need to protect my child. Wow. In the womb. So I went, I'm not doing that. And Bob Fosse was so mad. I go, no, I'm not doing this. And so I left. He was very upset. He was very suspicious, uh, superstitious. Mm. So he And there were a lot of things that happened on that set. Um, uh, one of the young kids who played young Fosse was killed in a crash in Connecticut. Oh. And then the producer who was part of our production team, he died of a heart attack. And he oh. kept saying, how's Diane's baby? Did Diane have her baby? And they go, yes, she did. He goes, oh, good. I'm glad that happened. Hmm. You know, stuff like that. Wow. And um, I have no regrets about that. That's amazing. I was working with great, great people. And, and then having a child, and I remember putting my daughter in a, in a, babe, a little sack, and auditioning <laughs> for Wolfen. And it was Michael Wadley who had, who had won the Academy Award for um, Woodstock. And he had long hair. He was a Harvard dropout. He was really kind of like cool, you know. And I went in there after some really wonderful actresses. And I had no one to take care of my daughter. So I just put her over on a table and I did my audition. And <laughs> it was like postpartum. And he said, I hired you at the spot. I thought, how cool was that? A baby in the sack. Because he was a hippie. So he hired me because I had a baby in the sack. But I may not have been worthy of that role. He goes, oh, no, no. I just love that whole whole thing. <laughs> so you never know how you get hired. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> Great. That was Wolfen. Yeah, and I remember because I met Lindsay Krauss afterwards. Who Lindsay had auditioned for it. Lindsay was married to David Mamet at the time. So we were at David wow. Mamet's house because David was doing, he wrote the screenplay for The Verdict, and Andre was the director of photography on that film. Oh, The Verdict. Yeah, so we're all at their house, and there's Lindsay going, yes, I know you got that part. I went, what part? She said, Wolfen. I, I said, oh, you were up for it? She goes, yes. And I knew she was a better actress than I was, I thought. I don't know why you got it. I said, I don't either. <laughs> she said that to you. Oh I, I, I loved your last play. I mean, what, what, what do you say? Meanwhile, her husband's there, and uh, you know, <laughs> David's like, oh man, you know, whatever. But it was fun. That oh is fun. Oh, <sighs> meet a lot of good people, a lot of great people. We got oh, the yeah. thing is, it's holding on to who you are, knowing who. This when, when I was in Chris Valentin's class, knowing who you are and whose you are. That is it. Identity, because every part's about identity. Who am I? Where am I? What am I doing? Mm. So for me, because I didn't know who I was, I could lend myself to a role and, and go, go into that without ever having to deal with Diane. Right. But then, so, so I was at Sozo. This is amazing. I've had all these different personalities. They don't want to say anything at Sozo because they're also, oh, Shabar. Oh, you know what? You talk about acting. You know, when a kid is in, in trouble or a kid is abused, he'll find all kinds of altars in order to take care of that one person. So we, we, we celebrate that family. However, they have mm. to go because sometimes they rise up and they do bad things. Mm. Yes. Wow. My husband would say, I don't know who I'm coming home to today. I go, but isn't it marvelous? One wife, 14 women, <laughs> <laughs> a man's tree. He goes, mm, not always so, so good, darling. So you weren't doing real good. Now tell us about what happened. How did, what happened with this car accident? Like, I, I, so I was, you, were, you were getting success in the world, success in your career. Nobody would ever know. But, Nobody would ever know because that's why I have great crying respect. Out of the inside. I have great respect for people who are successful and they're mm -hmm. in at People Magazine. What is underneath it doesn't matter what people say, because I grew up in a world that you don't tell anyone your business. Right. Mm -hmm. You keep your business to yourself. You don't okay. air your laundry out in public. So for me to be as open as I am is a very a big switch. So mm -hmm. I would never tell anyone how I was feeling about anything. Um, I was playing Masha and the Seagull. Uh, in New York with Michael Christopher, who had just won the Pulitzer um, and the Tony Award for The Shadow Box. I love Michael Christopher. So this and is on Broadway? He was on Broadway, yeah. So I so I was in a play with with um, Joanne Woodward, who was Paul Newman's wife. Yes. And she won Academy Awards, and she's an incredible actress. At Meisner, all, they're all Meisner actors, and they also taught at Meisner, and Lee Strasberg. And I was, so she played um, the, the mother, my aunt, 
And then Boyd Gaines, another great Tony Award winning actor, also Juilliard. He played Treplev. It was a great cast. And I played Gosh. Masha. And for me... Oh, it's again, a pivotal role, right? Mm-hmm. Because I've always seen the role played. I never liked Masha. I thought, I've seen great people play it and never understood the role. And I thought... I want to go back and see you do so it. So I want to say... I said, <laughs> Dang, so, I missed so, it. So Dang. I do all my research and everything. And, and, and the director says, I, I don't know what you're doing. I see. He goes, I liked your rehearsal yesterday. We... I thought it was very funny. I go, I know, but that was yesterday, and today I'm trying to find the other side of it. I'm very scared, he said. I said, well, don't be scared. I'm scared, too. I can't be scared for both of us. I said, don't worry, sir. At the end of, by opening night, I'll, I'll have it. And he was like, his eyes, I, this poor man. This is on Broadway, isn't it? No, no, this was, this was in New York. This was upstate. This was at, 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 in um, Woodstock. We, oh, did it for, we did it for summer with Fordham. Fordham, um, the, the head of Fordham University, great guy, Larry Sakharov, brilliant director. And so if from this, it would either move right. because it had all these people, and I got, a, I got a really good job out of it. But when I was up there, Masha was a very difficult role because I had learned from Andre Serban when I did Vanya um, in New York with F. Murray Abraham and the great Joe Chaikin, who is the, the father of the living theater, and, um, and Franny Conroy from school. And we're doing, and, and Andre from Romania, he was like the wunderkind at the time, he would say, I hate your acting. It's, he used some expletive. He said, you and this Yale, and he mentioned Merrill and Sigourney. He said, he called it this blank acting. It's like museum, like a museum piece. You could sneeze and the dust flies off your terrible performances. Wow. Well, I didn't understand what he was saying because I was right out of school, you know. Blah, blah. And he said, I want, I want you to pretend you are the dying swan. I want you to run, I want you to clap down, get up, turn around three times and fall, and then raise your arms and say your line. I said, okay. <laughs> so I, was, I, I failed in that production. Um, so the next one that I did, uh-huh. he said, acting Chekhov, you Americans, you're so psychological. And it, 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 you, you, the play is a tragic comedy. It's, it's between laughter and tears. It's called a comedy. You have to find it like you're, you're doing burlesque. Hmm. I said, burlesque. So I looked at burlesque and went, mm. you're on a tightrope. You could go this way or that way. And I, I liked what he said. I couldn't figure it out, but I, I knew he was right. So I went to the Museum of Modern Art, and we watched a Russian, uh, a Russian film of Vanya and saw how the Russians do it. Mm-hmm. Then we saw how the British do it. And there's something else. So when I got to do Masha, I got it. I knew what he meant. He said, your technique, your voice, you have all of that, your hair, the way you move, he said, now, 1904 is now. It has to bring it into the now. Wow. So um, I was doing all this research and work. And at one time, I was in the middle of rehearsal. And because she's a character who said, Masha, why do you always wear black? She said, I am, I am in mourning for my life. I'm unhappy. And I thought, hmm. I saw Pamela Payton Wright do it. She was brilliant and funny. There was something not burlesque about. So how to push the envelope, how to take a scene as high as it's going to go until you fall off the mountain. Before you fall off and kill yourself, bring it back just a little bit. And as low as the valley will hold you. And before you go to hell, bring it back just a little bit. And between two polar zones, you have a great performance. Wow. I learned that from Albert Finney, and I learned that at Julia. Albert Finney. Because that, that was on Wolfen. Oh, you worked with him. Yeah, because he, he told me, he said, I'm nursing my daughter. And he goes, you know, the Americans, they're so, well, I don't mean to be rude. <laughs> but you talk about naturalism. You talk about everything being real. Well, it's hogwash. He said, I call American actors lithium performers. There's no highs and no lows. It's a mm. flat line, mm. and you call it natural. But it isn't. It's fake. And I agreed with him. Wow. And they told me about playing Hamlet for Peter Hall. And I said, and I had no idea. But I played Hamlet how many years later, but at that time he oh. said... Oh, you hadn't played Hamlet <clears> yet. Yeah, he no. said, when I got to the... To the I got to the part where Polonius is behind the curtain. I had this overwhelming feeling to take the rapier and to slash the curtains. Mm. And Peter Hall said, what are you doing, Albie? Um, I, this is how I... He goes, no, 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 no. It's dead for a duck at dead. One thrust in, one thrust out. That's the way it's done. That's the way it always will be done. And that's the way you will do it. I said, so what did you do? He said, I did it as he told me. I went, oh, I took that away. So I got to that place at Hamlet and I found... He was right. But for me, when they said, 
how do you want him to die? Because Mr. Papp said the same thing Peter Hall said. Mm. But my fight director from England said, how do you want him to die? I said, I want to feel him die in my arms. And I want to come into the closet scene without a rapier because that actress knows what I'm going to do. And I have to surprise her. I don't want her to know what I'm going to do. He said, well, how about a long dagger in the inside of your boot? I said, yes. Mm. And so when, when, you played yeah, so when Joe, Joe Papp said, what I said, you're the first woman to ever play Hamlet. First American woman to play. First American woman. French have done it. Sarah Bernhardt did it. Even like Galliane did it. Um, but I'm the first American to do it. And so when I did that, so I walked into this thing because cause I'm a woman playing this role before the gay movement came out and everything. Mm -hmm. And when I came in and she she went, Hamlet, thou thou hast thy father much offended. I went, thou, 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 my father much offended. Go go. And all of a sudden, I grabbed that thing from the inside of my boot, throw it right up into her into her juggler, and she went. I went, that's it. That's the response I wanted. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And also, and then, and then t grabbing the curtain and going over and over and over and over and feeling this man die. So when she says, what hast thou done? I say, nay, I know not. And it's true. He doesn't know. Because it's, like like, it's almost like an ejaculation. It's like, <gasps> mm. and there's the line. What a rash and bloody deed is this. Because there's something about rashness that I've never seen. And in the Hamlet eye. thinks it's... Obviously, uh, he thinks it's the king. It's the king. The king. Yeah, because he does. He can't. Who killed his father? So all these marvelous things, and and um, because because when you own them, that's why you can't tell certain artists when they you do the work alone. So after rehearsal from ten a.m. to seven, or t ten to six, everybody left the theater. I came back at seven by myself and worked till midnight till they threw me out of that theater because I had to find out what it really was. Gosh, that is dedication. Mm. And, and so you've, you've had a full day of rehearsal. Yes. And then you come back by yourself. Until they threw me out. Oh my gosh, that and, is and, amazing. So, so only because I, I worked with a very a director I, I, I loved and honored. And he, you can't... Uh, pap, pap. Yeah, you can't... You, you, if you're good, I learned, it's a big lesson I learned. Instead of telling him or talking about a role, just show him. If he, otherwise, he said, I can out-theorize Hamlet with you because he's, he's done it. He's done it with every, every iconoclastic actor you can name. And he knows all the lines. So I said, okay, so I have to come into rehearsal knowing what I want to do. And then when he says to do something, I'll say, uh, yes, could, could I just show you something? And he'd say yes. Wow. And when I would show him with that commitment, he goes, you know, I've never seen it done that way, mm. but I believe you. You can do it. <laughs> wow. But the only way to get there for me was to, come back after was to work it so mm. deep. So when a musician works his licks and then someone says, do this, I think the musician knows more. I think you can, you can finesse it and you can, you can agree on some things. But there's some things an artist has to say, this is it. And they have to trust you because mm -hmm. usually you win. Yeah. Every time I've done that, we have won against what they've said or against their, their thing. <laughs> um, so what happened in in the the seagull when you were playing Marsha? That was when the car accident. Yes, happened. because I was on, I, I, I was on an edge because was I I lost my teeth in the middle of rehearsal. Lost I lost your teeth. Yeah, I, lo I, I did something and my, my caps flew out and oh. I had nothing but those little stumps. Oh. So what happened was Diane went like, oh, like I was so embarrassed. I went, that's it, that's who she is. What a marvelous find. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Except Use everything, it. <laughs> except everything, deny nothing. I went, oh my God, this is fantastic. Then I saw it from a whole different point, point of view. So I, I brought that into it. So then, and then she, she takes snuff and they say she's going to drink. Do you want me to go? Is it over? No, no, no. Because okay, she takes snuff and I went, why does anyone take snuff? Could be cocaine like today is the 80s. <gasps> Maybe filling up the emptiness in her life like I've tried to do all those years. Fill up the emptiness. Yeah, drugs, drinking. And there's a line that says, she'll have a few before lunch. I never understood that. She leaves and she goes, um, my foot's asleep. It must be time for lunch. My foot's asleep. And she leaves. And then the doctor says, she'll have a few before lunch. I said, well, a few what? Ah, how to build that in. I had to build that in so that when, when I actually left, people went, that's right. So what did I find? By that thing inside, I knew that I was obsessed with this man. And then all the imagery of, of Hamlet and Ophelia. Mm. So I became, I'm Ophelia. I'm the greatest actress in this entire play. Meaning, it's a play about theater people, opera, dance. And the sequel is all about the theater. Mm -hmm. yeah, so yeah. I said, so my first line is, I'm coming onto the stage. 
and there's a curtain, and it's all with Stanislavski's work. I always go back to, to the greats, Ellen Terry, all the ones who've done things before, which Stanislavski said about the play. I do all my research and find what I can use to become greater. Mm. Yes. So I, I touched the curtain, it was velvet, and I thought, as I touch this curtain, I'm getting strength to be the actress I really want to be that nobody knows in this, in this world that I live in. And he goes, Masha, why do you always wear black? And suddenly, I was Medea in my head. So I went, I, I can't want to do it here. Changes and himself. I, went, I am in, I was, in my mind, I was callous in the last act, right? I am in mourning of my life. And then he went like this, and he went, I'm unhappy. So, so it was like, Wah! I'm unhappy. You want some? I was like, <laughs> and everybody burst out laughing. I went, that's what Andre Serban meant. Mm. On the edge. Go that far and that far. Amazing. And then and now suddenly, it had all those ribbons. So I, I could take it as high as I wanted to and then drop it down. And and, and Boyd was um, very much an actor's actor from Juilliard. And he'd say, oh, that Masha, she drives me crazy. I, th- I never believed him. So I watched what he did in the beginning. And um, I figured there were medicine bottles for the, the doctor for his valerian drops. So I stole one of the medicine bottles because they look like little, you know, like little corks in them. And I put water in it like it would be vodka. And I put it in my pocket. So when he was having his, I actually took mine out and, and toasted him. So we can see laying in something that mm-hmm. she's drinking. Mm-hmm. Because when I worked on Bird, we talked about um, Charlie Parker's medicine. The film Bird? Yeah. So his, his heroin is his medicine. So this is her medicine. So I was drinking that. So that. So then So we, we laid all that in. Um, so when it came time to act, I mean, it, it, it just, once the imagination is free in the actor, he can find within the play. And remember Joanne Woodward saying to me, I have no idea what you're doing on the stage, but I do believe every every word of it. Mm. I went, oh, that's good. Because she would say to me, so when, so Boyd was, he opened a, a, a book and he took out his, so I said, hmm. So the Ophelia element, I went out into the floor and I put ferns in his book. I put daisies in his, where his handkerchief was. And I put little pieces of flowers. So every time he opened his book, I didn't tell him, I was supposed to do that, but I did tell him in this one rehearsal. And this thing fell out. He kept going on, and the next thing fell out. And then he wiped the sweat off his head, and he had a, he had a daisy smack on his forehead. And he went, <laughs> and then he went, Masha, I drive me crazy. I went, yes, that's exactly right. That's incredible. <laughs> so, that's what, so my point is, remember, I couldn't conflict. Yeah. So I found a way to deal with conflict. Wow. So all of that, I was in that mode. I was unhappy. It was the middle of a divorce. And I used to drive. marriage had failed. Yeah, it had failed. And, and, you know, it was very crazy. And you and had a baby? Yeah, she was five. She was just turned five. And I was driving cars really fast at night. So I, I, I saw the principle of rebellion. I saw I drove, drove my car really fast at night because I figured after 11 o'clock or 12 o'clock in that area, nobody was around. So I took that car 70 miles an hour on hairpin turns where it said 20 mile an hour zones. And I would just mm. do it with my hair going like this thing. Oh, I'm free. I'm free. Yeah. Wow. Well, the setup was great because one night after opening night, I dropped off four apprentices and I said, I'm going. I went back to my, my apartment and I heard a voice. This is the first time I ever heard a voice. The voice of God. No? The other voice. <gasps> I went like this. You don't want to go there. I don't? Yeah, look. It's so dark in there. Yeah, it is. And your daughter's with, with, with her father and he's with that girl yeah and you're all alone yeah now watch this it was like poor you this self-pity I never realized self-pity was a spirit and it was real and it just stroked my body oh and I partnered with it now watch this I went but I'm really tired I really what Mm. if you go back to the to the restaurant you can get more kudos from people and I said yeah but it closes in half an hour but you can get there in 15 minutes you've been on these roads before now wow. watch this thought. And I went, okay. And I heard like a click. I actually heard this click. What the heck was that? I backed the car out and went 20, 40, 60, 70. I get to the top of a hill. Wow. I'm in the middle of the road because it's only a lane and a half. And there are headlights. This is 1.30 in the morning. There's one the headlights right in my face and there's no place to go. I went, wow. And out of my mouth, I went, Jesus. Now I remember... You call on the name of Jesus, you will be saved. And I wasn't a curse. I went, Jesus, and went flipped right off that cliff. I, I was airborne. I had no I had no seatbelt on. And all of a sudden, see, I can't explain this to anyone because it, it's, it's fuzzy with me. So you didn't hit the other car? No, miss- I, I missed it by, by doing this. I would have killed those people. 
because I was going so fast. They didn't, they didn't have a chance. So I went off like this. And I said, Jesus, and, I, and, I, and I'm in the air. I saw, I saw hell. I saw, I saw darkness that was so dark. I thought, I don't want to die. I don't want to die. I'd always been a little bit in love with death. Actors, be careful. Always been a little bit in love with you know, the dark side. And now there it was. And mm-hmm. I went, I don't want to die. I don't want to die. And I don't remember anything else, but I remember before I landed, I saw an arm, like a hand from here to here, like a specter of an arm, go like this as I was propelled out of the car. And it stopped me at the windshield. I smacked the windshield. And the car, I don't know how, it it finally stopped. And I had lost the new caps, blood. I'm on the other side, I'm on the passenger side, and the back seat pinned my head to that windshield. But I didn't go through it. I would have gone through it. The car was totaled. And I remember going, mm. how am I going to get out of this? Mm. And all those teeth could cost me more money. And then I hear the cops. And when the cops came, they said, is he dead? Is he dead? Car's, car's totaled. Can't get, I don't see any movement. I see blood. I don't see any movement. Is he, and then I said, there's movement on the passenger side. Are you all right? Who is it? I don't know. I can't tell. Are you all right? And I didn't say anything. And they go, so they crowbarred the car open. And then they took me out and they said, are you, are you, have you been drinking? I said, yes. And they go, uh, were you wearing a seatbelt? I said, no. And I'm like, this, no, yes, no. So anyway, can you walk a straight line? Of course, I can, walk, I can do anything. And then they, they said, we have to take you to the hospital because you're, you're really in bad shape. I said, no. Because I, with publicity, I, could, I, I, I said, no. So they asked me three times. They were really kind. Because you're doing the flying. Yeah, but they didn't know this. So also wow. they said, no, no, no. And finally, they, they handcuffed me, read me my rights, put me in the back of the squad car. And now I'm going to jail. <clears throat> so now I'm sitting there thinking, how the heck did I get here? And I hear a voice say, you got here after 19 years of hating your father. And you spiraled all the way down to this place. With 17 years of hating you. And I went, Oh my gosh, this is terrible. Officer, what's the worst thing that can happen to me? We'll spend 24 hours in jail as the law in New York State, and you'll be arraigned in court in a few hours, and and, uh, and then we'll find out from the judge what the rest of it will be. I said, oh. And I said, I don't believe in praying. I don't believe in God. I said, I don't believe in God, so it's really inconvenient to pray. Mm, yeah. But if there is a God, have mercy on me, knowing the speech from the Merchant of Venice. It's the only thing I know about the word mercy. Oh, Quality of mercy is not strange. It dropped yeah. it as a gentleman. That's all I knew. So I said mercy. And then I said, and when I, I said, one our father from my Catholic school. And I meant it. The Lord's Prayer. Mm. Yeah. I had mercy on me. And that was it. Then I get into the court, fingerprinted, arraigned, and they brought out at 2.30 in the morning the director, the producers, the executive producers to identify me. Shame! Oh my God, I have this was shame no. in my life. Two thirty in the morning. Yep, yeah, uh, almost three. So it was three o'clock in the morning. They got him out of bed. Yep, because they didn't know I had no papers on me. So they brought them. Oops. I couldn't. I, I couldn't even look at them. And they had. They had a what do you call a uh, prosecuting attorney? Where they dug him in, in the middle of the night, and he's there, and they're going after me. Mothers against drunk drivers, and, and how crazy I am, and all this other stuff. And the two arresting officers are on my side. Then, all of a sudden, the judge comes in, bailiff says, I'll rise, and comes this, this judge, and she's like Judge Judy, the great Judge Judy, New York. I mean, like, all right, sit down. Mm. And she goes like this, she goes, <laughs> she goes, don't worry about waking me up, my husband's having an open heart surgery in Arizona this morning, so I was up and I'm thinking about him and what happened to you. And out of my mouth, remember I say nothing, I went, oh, I want, I want, I'm just very sad. And this voice said, don't tell anybody how you feel. That's right, don't tell anybody how I feel. Just suck it up, girl. Wow. So I did. And then she goes, okay, so this is what we got. Da, 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 da. She reads all this stuff. I must owe 30 grand, whatever. And she goes, how do you plead? I said, guilty. And she went, okay. Then she goes, onto all these things. And the guy goes, after all these things, I can't look at any of those people. And then in the middle of it all, she goes, wait a minute. It says here that you have a kid. I said, yeah. She goes, you? And she was so, I'm in contempt for me. You, you have a kid. You gotta be kidding me. What is it? I said, it's a girl. How old is it? I said, five. She said, you have a five year old kid. Unbelievable that you would allow anything to happen to you. Uh, she said, don't you find it highly selfish, self centered, and self consumed that you would allow anything to happen to you to jeopardize that child's future? I said, well, no, Your Honor, I don't think about her at all because I didn't want my daughter. Okay? When she said that, when I said that, she got so mad. She took that gavel and she screamed and she went, obviously you don't. And she smacked this thing and it felt like that. And when it felt like that, the inside of me went, 
Oh, thank God someone said stop. Because I had been running all those years and didn't realize it until that moment. The inner, inner speed. And then she went on and on and on. And in the middle of all of that, like two hours later, she stops and she goes, On second thought, Miss Venora, I'm not going to put you in jail. And when she said that, there was an audible gasp from the, from the police officer. They went, <gasps> And meanwhile, that guy, the prosecutor, jumps up and goes, Your Honor, excuse me. This woman is guilty. She is this. She's crazy. She's And, and I'm going like this. Yeah, he's, he's, he's right. I'm going to listen to him. And so she got so mad. She goes, Counselor, take a seat. I'm the judge on this side of the bench. And when you grow up to be me, you can call the shots. Sit down. <laughs> and then she turned to me like like without further ado. Oh and she goes, gosh. now, Miss Venard, you, I, I'm not going to put you in jail. Do you know why? I said, no, I don't know why. Get this. It's because I saw you in that play the other night. <gasps> what? Oh, my gosh. She saw you play Masha. And you were so good in it. I'd like you to be in it again tonight. I just realized that if I put you in jail, you won't make it. Watch the language. No, this is not real. She goes, you won't make your half hour call now, will you? And I'm going like, and I heard, mercy, number one. Wow. Different voice. And I was sober by then, so I was like. <gasps> so. By the time they brought me home and the, and the executive, I lost my license for like forever, and I'd have to go to oh, rehab, have to pay goodness. all the debts, and be and get myself a lawyer because I was going to need one. So I called this lawyer and told him <sighs> I was guilty, and and it all it, was, it was like. <clears throat> but anyway, the bottom line was, um, wow, I went home. You experienced the mercy of God. Yeah, I, I got home. And I went. What does that mercy mean? I heard mercy, so I went to my dictionary, like I always do, yep. and it said mercy from the French to receive a blessing one does not deserve. I thought, well, I don't deserve a blessing at all. Uh oh, <laughs> blessing God, God blessing. Forget it. Forget. It. Oh no! Slam the book. There's no God. I'm not dealing with God at all. Wow. So I went and I called my husband, mm. and he was with a very famous person, and he she says. Don't let her call you here. So I told him what happened. I almost died. And he, he started to laugh. And he said, well, I've had a lot of accidents. Don't call me anymore. Click. So then I called oh my, my agent. Gosh. Okay. Called my agent at William Morris. And uh, she picked up the phone. She said, how much money do you need? I said, I need about 30000 She said, well, FedEx it overnight because you're good for the money. So they sent the money. And then meanwhile, I sat there and I couldn't sleep because I told I went to sleep. My ribs, I had hurt my ribs and I wouldn't. I kept PTSD. I kept going back over. Oh, I, I, I go the in the car. Of the yeah, and then the car is and I wake up because I'm going to have to smash, going to smash into it. And I started shaking like this, and I'm sweating. And I go, oh, I got to talk to somebody. I'll never forget. I had to talk to somebody. I, 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 I don't believe in God, but somebody saved my life tonight. I don't know who you are, but let me just tell you about me. I'm a failure. I said. Nobody knows it though, because mm. I make money and I get jobs. But I'm a failure. I failed as a child because I don't love my parents. I don't love my husband. I don't love my child. And if you're a God of some kind, you already know that. Because people love me. I know they love me, but the walls are too thick and too high, too hard to climb. And nothing goes in and nothing goes out. And there's nothing I can do about it. That's just the way it is. I don't trust nobody. I ain't going to church. I hate church. Why? They're all phony, fake. They all wear perfume. It gives me a headache. And I don't want to go any place like that. I won't go to NA. I won't go to AA because I'm too vain. I'm too selfish. I'm too proud to be in a group because I'm special. So if you're a god, here's the deal. You gotta be more real than what I know is real. I have lived by the gospel that I can live with who I want, eat what I want, sleep with who I want, go where I want, and I'm free. And then I went like this. Who am I kidding? Look at me. I'm choking to death on the chains of this freedom because it owns me now. I believe I could I could I could take drugs, I could it doesn't, but it owns me now. I can't get out of it. Now I'm in trap. So if you're a guy, you got to be more real than this. And I listed depression, sex, suicide, hunger, fear, hatred, bitterness. I listed those are real to me. So if you're going to be a guy, you got to be more real than that. Wow. I'm going to ask you to heal me of drugs and alcohol because I can't get out of it. If you do that, I'll follow you the rest of my life and say no to the other guy. That was it. Went to sleep. Got my teeth fixed. Oh, they put rubber teeth in. Hmm. Went to the theater that night and nobody said a word and I was still a mess. But when I got to this one place, when you write your book, Trigorin, don't say best wishes to Masha. I went, poo. I said, write to Masha, who doesn't know who 
she is. Or why she's alive. And the audience went, oh! And then Nina comes in and I looked at like, like a jacuzzi, I backed off and a pause. And I went, you are not an actress. You are quitting now. You are not an actress. It cannot cost you your life. That's how deep I was. It can't cost you your life. That's how great it was to me. Because it, so then I realized I was healed of drugs and alcohol that night because wow. I went to the same parties, same Coke, same drugs, and I never seemed to get to it. Huh. Must be. Hmm. Oversight. Then I'd go, no, never got to it. <laughs> now the months are going by. I never got to it. Finally, my friends go, are you going to come to the club with us? I go, you know, I'm like, Diane, you haven't come, gone out with us at all. What's, what's wrong with you? I go, what's wrong with me? What's wrong? <gasps> I don't have to. Wow. I don't have to go. Wow. Well, click, I lost my friends. And then it began to, to, God began to shift the way I saw things, even the parts I was playing. Wow. Yeah, I wanted you to comment on the shift in your career from that point because one of the things that's so inspiring about you is you've been so unwavering in yeah, your I, faith. I, and after I accepted Jesus, I got every single movie on witchcraft. Uh, Angel Heart. You had to say no to a lot of things. Witches of Eastwick, which which Michael Christopher wrote the part for me. <gasps> That's the one. Oh and my then gosh. And then Saran ended up playing it. Mm -hmm. But I, I went, the devil went, <gasps> with Jack Nicholson. I went, oh! I suddenly, I was like, and I threw the thing out. And how many mm -hmm. years later, God let me play Jack Nicholson's daughter. Oh, wow. So he's, wow. He, comes, he comes back around. But I'm Was just, it difficult to say no, no to the number of films? No, it wasn't. No, because no. I was terrified. I had a fear of God. Yeah. I thought, I went like this, hmm, couldn't get that job before. Now suddenly I'm getting all those jobs. I wonder what that's about. Huh. I'm no different than an actor. I don't trust that. Say no. My agents were going like, what's wrong with you? I go, um, I just, I'm a feminist. And I don't want to play anything where women are treated badly mm. or pissed on or this or that. I want women to feel free and dignified. Well, good. Well, let us know way before them of getting a bad reputation of saying no at the last minute. Okay, I will. Mm. But this is how it began. And this is where the Word of God, I never had not read the Bible, and the Word of God is alive and real, and God will speak His Word to you where you have never read it. Here's the example. I go to a backer's audition. I have no money. My husband's gone. I'm without funds because I didn't have a lawyer yet. And I have a $500 gig for a backer's audition for a Broadway show. So I didn't read it. I'm at the dentist. I figure I'm just going to go there, do it, do the rehearsal, and get the money and split. I'm at the thing. I think I'll read it. Then I read it, and it is so foul. It is mm. so dark. And then I go, I said, God, if this is you, I'm going to do this. I'm a professional. I'm not going to back out the last minute. I, if you want me out of this, then you get me out of this because mm. there's no way I'm going out of this. So I get down there, and the, the writer goes, what did you think, Ms. Finner? I go, oh, I love your play. I said, it's so wonderful. But it's, it's totally against women and, and, and completely against God. But don't worry. I'm just going through something. I'll, I'll be fine. Go to the go to the stage manager. I go, sir, uh, is there any way you can replace me? He goes, what? I, oh, I'm just asking. I'm not feeling very well. I'm going through something. But it's just, it'll pass. But if you, if you could, I would appreciate it. But if not, it's all right. He goes, Okay, well, well I, I, no, no problem. So we, now we do it. We get to the reading. Every time something bad foul happens, I can't control myself. I'm going, <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, I see. And the mother, <laughs> I mean, I have lost my mind. <laughs> I can't control myself. Anyway, we finish That's the thing, hilarious. and the actor's like, what the? And then I hear the stage manager go, we found a replacement for Miss Venora. I was like, oh. <gasps> That's God. It's like goodbye, everybody. I'm sorry. I'll be all right. I'm just having. I'm, I'm going through something. It's a little, you know, just a little thing, just a little and, life and, change. And, and here's it at the end. I get into a cab. I'm so excited, and then I sit there going like this. The guy who's driving is a Sikh, and I go, "What did I just do? I just gave up five hundred dollars. I mean, when I was like living like prostitution and 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 drug addiction, I was cool. I was rich, mm -hmm. and now I got this God, and I'm poor." And I'm crazy. No, I'm really crazy. I'm crazy. I'm sober. I'm crazy. Oh, I'm crazy. And the man goes, mm, lady, you all right? You all right, lady? I go, no, I'm not all right at all. I just, I, I can't, can't, can't believe it. I just, and all of a sudden I hear a vo that voice, this voice. Why are you crying? Well, because I just gave up. My and it, then it went like this. Why are you crying? Today is not a day of sadness, Diane. Today is a day of victory. Remember, when you honor me, I honor you. And I went, whoa. I was so calm. I went, oh, okay. 
Years later, when I was with David Wilkerson's ministry, and I had given up my career, Mm -hmm. and I got sued for custody after I had done everything God told me to do. I was so mad at God. Mm. I said, and I cried and yelled, and I went, sorry, I yelled at you, God. Forgive me and help me, because they were coming after me after I gave up millions of dollars. Okay, so I go I go to bed. The phone rings. It's David Wilkerson, who I did not really know. And he mm-hmm. goes, hello, this is Pastor Dave. I went, yes. Um, I heard about your situation with this needing a lawyer, and, you know, we're inner city people, and we, we have, we have I, I said, I know, like, the church isn't going to help you. You know, my eyes are going like this. <laughs> and then he goes, because he goes like this, and I remember throwing the Bible, he's saying, it's supposed to help. I said, yeah, it's crying, but, you know. And he goes, so um, I actually spoke, uh, I, I'm never usually in the office, but I was here. And so I called a few people. I called a few people, and I called a husband and wife on our board of directors who own 50 corporations throughout the world among them, and he named some very heavy-duty heavy things. He said, and they uh, worked with you and your daughter on the Jim Henson thing that we had done for for Christian audiences. Hmm. I was an acting coach there. I said, yes. He goes, well, they've been praying for the last few months, and you've been on their hearts and their prayer time, and they feel to tell, I told them what your situation was. They said, well, they have 50 lawyers that work for them from Dubois and Plimpton in New York, and they will get you the best divorce and custody lawyer in New York City, and they'll pay your bill. I am now silent. And he goes, are you there? I said, yes. He said, you gave up a lucrative career a few years ago. I said, yes, I did, sir. He goes, now, remember this. God's heart is for children. And in the book of Samuel, it says, remember, when you honor him, he honors you. I said, what, what? What did you say? Where'd you get that? Oh, it's from the Bible. You're kidding. Wow. He goes, this is, they're gonna, this is a free gift from God from the heart of of God through the people of God who believe that true religion is caring for widows and orphans under which heading you come. You may never have to pay it back, Diane, but keep your ears, eyes open. It may be required of you one day. And of course it has been. And this is so exciting. So three months later, I get the best lawyer in New York for custody who happens to be De Niro's lawyer, Sinatra's lawyer, Mia Farrow's lawyer, who actually won the case against Woody Allen. Oh my gosh. By asking one question. Who's your son's pediatrician? And what's his favorite toy? She was a killer. This woman scared the death. So anyway, $250,000 in cash later, I had my daughter. That is God. So the word of God came to me. I never read it. He spoke. He is the word made flesh. He he is the word. And when you're in God, he will speak himself to you. Wow. Wow. Hmm. Selah. Hallelujah. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. Diane, that's unbelievable. It really Whoa. is. Can you talk to us about, <clears throat> by trade, you're in entertainment, you're an acting coach now, which by the way, I can't even describe having acting class with Diane. It's probably unlike anything. Christine, I both. <laughs> anything in Diane's LA, class. I imagine. Um, but you're such a radical minister and you don't leave that out of class and you bring that all, all of that in. Can you talk about that, how you bring in everything you learn, you've learned along the way into teaching this next generation, how it's all the same in class? I feel like it. people are being trained in excellence in their craft, yet they're also being released and freed up emotionally, spiritually. And that, that, That's, I think, the move of God because I, I never had any designs to teach ever mm-hmm. no because um, you're an artist you're performer, my, my daughter would always say well, you're you're a, you're a born teacher you, you you always you care about young people and i'd be in, in shows in new york and there'd be a young actress who was playing ophelia with some terrible director and i would take her aside and i'd say you know what he just said to you all of it's all of it's a lie mm. your instincts are right trust it i've played all these parts and i'm telling you something you trust it she got bad reviews this one girl and we had bad review in new york times nobody calls you so i called her and she's a very famous actress now. You would know her. Wow. And I said to her, okay, you got that out of the way. Tonight, you play it the way you play it. And she did. And she was great. Wow. Because I can't stand hell. So what I'm saying to you is that I was at Bethel, and um, I'm in class with uh, Valentin talking about you know govern- government and uh, the who, the what, the mission. Who, what's your mission? What's your vision? I said, I have no mission. I have no vision. And everybody around me has got all these plans. We're all going to Hollywood. I go, oh, great. Go. Um, I'd love to see you guys go there. Okay. And uh, So you went, how, you, how old were you when you went to do the, the ministry school? At the 2011, 12, 13. 
Wow, that's okay. incredible. So I'm yeah. there, and I'm like one of the oldest people there. And I love all the kids and stuff. And, and then I I just felt like I didn't go to the trans- – I went to the Transformation Center for because uh, I, I wanted to be in inner healing. And then um, the people from the uh, the acting division, tra- uh, the uh, artist area, said, why aren't you in our class? I said, because I've done this my whole life. Hmm. I want to find something new. Mm-hmm. So I feel – that when I looked at my hands, what do you have? So, so Valentin would say, "What's in your hands?" And I go, "Nothing's in my hands," because I, I, I have a very good pension from Screen Actors Guild, and I thought I could retire at Bethel, work at the Reading School of the Arts, and and, and help them to have a really great program. So I, yeah. I did work with them, and it was like I'm going to stay here and hide out. Mm-hmm. So he said, "You have to go back to Hollywood." I said, "I can't go back to Hollywood." I can't go back to Hollywood because I have too much. Yes. Too much I, had too, so I had too much pain. Like, yes, thank you. So, so that's when I met Katie Souza, mm. saying the reason you have to get rid of that pain to go back to Hollywood. Mm-hmm. So I said, okay. So sure enough, I was right, going to come. And, I was going to come and teach a workshop. Yeah. And I ended up being ill. I lost my voice. I couldn't get out of bed the, night, the day before I'm coming. I said, what the heck is this? Mm. So I called Patricia King's ministry, talked to Marcella Weiss, who's her, her assistant, and she said, you got to talk to Katie. I said, well, I don't know Katie personally. She said, I'll have her call you. So Katie went on FaceTime with me, and we found the root of a lot of this stuff. And um, she said, do you have my kingdom of the sun? I said, yeah. She said, you listen to it? I said, you sure did. She said, soak in the seven, the seven CD, soak in that. Look at Isaiah um, 34, 56, and, and put it on a loop all night. Call me in the morning. I had my voice in the morning. Wow. So I came, so she said you can have nothing in common. So she told me to sew into financially. So I sewed seven scholarships. She said two. Mm-hmm. I sewed seven. To, Come on. To counteract the generations of horse guy. thieves that were in my, in my family. So yes. whatever. So we had to counteract that. And then I got there. And as soon as I got there, I was sick again. So wow. then, this was amazing. Then I was so worried because that Friday night. So my assistant was with me and called Katie. She called me back. She said, look, I've just prayed. The Lord has given me permission. Raphael, the angel Raphael is with me right here. Can I send him to you? I said, yes. Then I said, yes. Fire came all all over my body. She said, you have your worship on? She said, okay. God has no time to do it. He's going to do a a supernatural healing of you in the inside. You're just going to listen to worship and let let the angel of healing do what he's got to do. I said, okay. So I closed my eyes. I had three hours. I closed my eyes and listened to worship, and I don't know where I was. I hear, you have to get ready to go. I went, get ready to go. I just I just closed my eyes. Oh my no, it was gosh, three hours. Three hours went like that. Oh and I not God. only had my voice, I had all my energy back, and I was never the same. So I... And so, you've been teaching ever since. Yes. Yes. Oh, gosh. Diane, now... You've got to go and pick up your granddaughter now. Goodbye. Your beautiful granddaughter. What time is it in real life? It's it's. We've got five minutes. Okay, we're fine. So we've got we've got four <laughs> questions now. Just to put, it, on, put you at rest, put me at rest, and all our listeners at rest. We hmm. will be doing. We're picking up where we left off here. We will be doing several more podcasts with you. Can I get the first one? Yes, you got the first one. Go. What's your favorite movie? Oh, on God. the waterfront. <sighs> what? On the waterfront. Yes. I don't know that. Oh my gosh, it's on it's on Amazon. You can watch it on Amazon Prime. Yeah, I can't Amazon believe Prime. I've never heard of this. It's amazing. I I had never watched it until Diane said that, and I what it's what, what it what, it's very it's Brando at his best. It's, it's Ily Kazan. Yeah. Ily Kazan directing. Unbelievable. Yeah, okay. Really good. And there's a, the priest, and it's really cool too. What's his name? The priest. Carl Malden. Carl Malden. Yes. Wow, I'm very intrigued. Yeah, you love really, it. Really good. <laughs> what else? Now, Diane, um, uh, you have the second question too. I forgot, I forgot what the second question is. You go. Um, if you were to pursue any other profession, what would it be? I think I know the answer to this, but I don't know. If I had the talent? Yeah. <laughs> if you could be any anything. I, I would be a musician. Mm, I was going to say or a dancer, but... Oh, d- definitely a dancer. Yeah. yeah. Yes. If I... if Yes, I probably would... Both. I would take... I you didn't think see. about it. Yeah. I would have been. I would have been a professional dancer. That that yeah. would have been my my dream as a kid. Um, today it would be musician. Yes. <laughs> that is so cool. You're such an artist. Yes. If you had another option, it would be another art. Form. Yes, mastering <laughs> the other art. You are an artist form. through and through. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, and, and probably you know rock guitar. Mm, nice. Come on. Come Take some on. lessons with Brock. <laughs> <laughs> what else? What do you have a favorite sound? It hasn't been created yet. 
Whoa. Oh. Yeah, it's coming. <laughs> wow. It hasn't, been, it hasn't been created yet. Um, I, can, I, I feel, I can feel some of it, but I can't, I can't say it. <sighs> can't say it. Mm. <laughs> and this is the last question, and this is the big one. When it's all over, everything's said and done, and you're standing there before God, what do you want to hear him say about Diane Venora? He's going to go like this. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe you made it. Come on in. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, we can't believe you're with us here in oh, Hollywood. Yeah. You yes, are it, such a gift to us, Diane Venora. It's such an and, honor. Yeah, and we love you. Thank and you. We're definitely doing more podcasts with you. And yes, I feel like more. we haven't even touched on everything. Yeah, just scratch well, this. It, sure. I'm, 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 I'm of the, I'm of the old, other generation, so I have a lot to to bring. Mm. But I also stay current. I don't believe in being somebody from there. It's bringing the old into the new. Come on. Like David with the, with the Ark of the Covenant. Bring the old into the new. And I want the kids to have the new order, but they have to know the old order. And yeah. all the great artists know whose ceiling is your floor. What did you learn before to get you where you are? And today I met a young animator this past weekend who said, oh, I don't need to know anything anybody else did. I said, unfortunate. That's unfortunate. Mm. That's a good idea. So, you, so but this is just historical. And all the great artists, I mean... Michael Jackson, any of them, they, they studied the greats to become greater in mm-hmm. every division. I mean, all all the great musicians I know, they know everything about everything. Yeah. Art, painting, design, whatever, mm-hmm. and, as well as music and opera and conducting and, you know, the classics. Yeah. That's why we're bringing classics into our class, but we did. Yes, yes. I do have one more question. It's probably a bit of a big question, but if we could sum it up a little bit. What do you feel like God's heart is for Hollywood right now? Knowing him. I think God's heart is, I, I can't say it in a word. I, I feel it in a sound, but I, I feel like God is saying, come up. Come. It's almost like, it's like re- remember, remember me. Mm. Remember, I don't know how to say it because it all sounds cliched. So it's not even that. It's like, a, I don't know what God's heart is for Hollywood. Everyone asks those questions, but but for me, it's like when people there, there are artists who, who who will never tell you they know God, but they know God. God is in their lives, mm. mm-hmm. and He's speaking to them. Where it gets funky is when you mix the holy with the unholy, and and, and you can get a lot of cool stuff out of that. All I'm saying is that not being a purist in that way, but the kingdom is creativity. And heaven is constantly creating. Yeah. And the people who really listen, when I hear someone like Prince say, well, how'd you get that music? Oh, God gave it to me. I'm listening and I heard it. Hmm. Now, you have the human spirit. You have the, you have the satanic spirit. You have the, you have the Holy Spirit. What's influencing you? Everything influences you. So I just say, I believe that God is, God is creativity. He is art. Apple came from God. Mickey Mouse came from God. Um, certain the sounds that these great come from God, and and or 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 can be twisted. Um, so all I know is I think that God wants us who who know Him to make Him known, wow. and He wants us to father a nation without religion, but with the excellence, the power, the creativity, the out out of the box, unbelievable. What's the word? Original, never before seen, heard, or done stuff that only he can he can reveal to those he trusts and those who are listening. And he's called many that you will never know. And they are already creating. They're already doing it. Mm. Whatever they call it, they call it. But I can see God, no matter what the name is. I can see God. Yeah. Uh, and I go, what can I learn from you there, Lord? It doesn't have a name or a code. Doesn't have a religion or a di- but I can. That's God. What can and I can take from that and then and profit nicely and then hope that the the Christian world doesn't. What's the word? 
put a cover on mm-hmm. things. Mm-hmm. God, so that's why the freedom of the church has to be. And God mm-hmm. is calling the church uh, yeah. for more diversity. He's calling the church to break out of a lot of things mm-hmm. because the church becomes its own code. It becomes its own monolith, its own monument. Yeah. Instead of, where is God going? Where are you going, God? Where's the Spirit going? Let's go with you. Wow. And it takes in yeah. all of these people who... Because we need to humble Guys ourselves. By the Spirit. Yeah. yeah, we need to humble ourselves and serve mm-hmm. others who have already gotten the thing from God and how to serve them and help them in places where they don't know Him. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we come alongside. So I don't think I've answered the question, but I just yes, feel no, there's, it, there's, a, there's a hugeness. And I don't feel that we've codified it. I don't think the church has got you know the skinny on it. And I think it's we. It's, it's the world. What, what is God saying to us mm-hmm. in, in His color design architecture? There are people who are, who are so lost and so brilliant. Mm. Mm. And so I think it's th- that's when God will interject you or that other kid into, into that place with that big king and help you to speak prophetically to the thing that's causing that great guy to kill himself on cocaine, even though he's his genius, and, and speak to that part that he can be released into his total design. Yeah. Mm. Amen. Wow. Amen. Amen. Thank Bye. you. Wow. <laughs> well, that's Iris After Hours. Hope you enjoyed it. This is not the last we've seen of Diane. We no. will be back with more podcasts with Diane. Yes, we hope you're inspired. Do yourself a favor and rewatch like all her movies. Yes, go on to they're IMDb. incredible. Heat was just credits. remastered. Yes, that'll <gasps> be re- so released good. in 4K very soon. She teaches classes in LA. It's amazing. And we're so inspired to know her. We hope you've been inspired. Transformationartist.org. Transformationartist.org. If you want more information. If you're in LA, you want to do some classes? Yes. Come on. If you have any comments. Great. Any comments? Yes. If you have comments, leave them in the comment section under our YouTube channel. And until next time. Ciao. This podcast is presented by Iris Global. For more information or to support the work of Iris Global, please visit us online at irisglobal.org